Okay, um, welcome everybody. This is the uh, back end of chapter 26. We're discussing acid base electrolyte and fluid balance, and we had left off in lecture uh, talking about potassium and its influence on uh, body function. This is the most uh, important factor affecting potassium, which is secretion. Um, via its concentration in the extracellular fluid. Um, potassium changes are um, critically important to the body. We can't let potassium levels get too high or too low in tissue fluid because you're going to dramatically affect membrane potential and that's going to uh, have dire consequences for the nervous system and for muscle contraction including the heart. A high potassium diet can lead to high potassium content in the extracellular fluid and this leads to potassium entry into the principal cells in the kidney which causes potassium secretion. So your kidney's job along with fluid balance is also a control of electrolyte balance, potassium being one of the critical electrolytes. A low potassium diet or accelerated potassium loss reduces its secretion, so the kidneys are going to try and retain potassium in the event that blood potassium begins to fall. Aldosterone is a major player here. Aldosterone is both our salt retaining hormone, so it causes to hold on to sodium, but it's also our potassium secreting hormone. Um, the principal cells are the targets of aldosterone. The adrenal cortex um, is directly sensitive to potassium concentrations in the extracellular fluid. An increased potassium content in the adrenal cortex is going to cause aldosterone release and that's going to trigger potassium secretion. Unfortunately, if we have abnormal secretion of aldosterone, we're going to screw up potassium levels and we can put ourselves uh, in jeopardy, in severe jeopardy. Uh, remember that um, hypo and hyperkalemia um, have profound influence over the excitability of muscle tissue. So this is going to have an influence on the heart rate and the heart rhythm. Um, it's also going to have an impact on skeletal muscle. Okay, um, We can cause uh, tetany and uh, over-responsiveness in the case of um, depolarization of the membrane and we can cause a lack of responsiveness if we end up generating hyperpolarization in the membrane. Remember, potassium is a major player in that. Calcium is also a critical player. 99% of calcium is found in the bones as phosphate salts. Calcium in the extracellular fluid is important for blood clotting, cell membrane permeability, secretory activities, and neuromuscular excitability, probably its most important role. Remember, for instance, that when the action potential reaches the end of the axon, calcium moves into the axon terminal. That results in neurotransmitter release, and that's how the electrical signal moves from neuron number one to neuron number two, or from a neuron to its target. Hypocalcemia leads to increased excitability and muscle tetany, while hypercalcemia is going to inhibit neuron and muscle cells and can cause heart arrhythmia. Fortunately, we have a couple of hormones that are major players controlling our blood calcium levels. Parathyroid hormone, of course, demineralizes bone, increases absorption uh, from the GI, and elevates blood calcium levels, while calcitonin has the opposite effect. Okay, It mineralizes bone and reduces blood calcium levels. Remember, parathyroid hormone made by the parathyroid gland and calcitonin by the thyroid. Rarely do calcium levels deviate from normal limits unless we have a problem with the endocrine system, which can happen. Sometimes we can get tumor tissue that oversecretes a particular hormone, and that screws up our blood calcium levels big time. Parathyroid hormone promotes an increase in calcium levels by targeting the bones. Osteoclast activity is accelerated and more calcium is released into the plasma. And it also increases calcium reabsorption at the kidneys, and increases calcium absorption through the small intestine. Um, this happens indirectly 
through stimulation of the kidneys to activate precursors to active vitamin D, which is a critical player uh, in, among other things, mineralization of bone. 98% of filtered calcium is reabsorbed due to parathyroid hormone activity. If extracellular fluid calcium levels um, are normal, PTH secretion is going to be inhibited. 75% of filtered phosphate gets reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule of the kidney. Parathyroid hormone inhibits this by decreasing the, um, the transport maximum. Okay? Transport maximum is simply um, a chemical method measuring the amount of a particular substance that you can move across, in this case, a tubule lumen in a particular period of time. Um, essentially, if you go past the transport maximum, that component is going to end up showing up in the urine. Uh, if you're below the transport maximum, then you're going to expect to see normal levels. Okay. Phosphate reabsorption is also affected by insulin, which decreases the transport max maximum, and glucagon, which increases. I'm sorry. Phosphate reabsorption is also affected by insulin, which increases the transport maximum, and glucagon, which decreases it. So what are we saying here? When we have insulin around, of course, that's the body signal to take up um, glucose from the blood and use it for energy or to store it later on as fat. One of the other consequences of the increase in the transport maximum is that we're going to hold on to more of our calcium. Flip side, glucagon is a hormone that mobilizes our fat and our glycogen stores to increase the sugar content in the blood between meals and what happens in the influence under the influence of glucagon is that we decrease the retention of calcium and we tend to secrete more of it. And So this is a look at how calcium balance is modulated by the endocrine system. Hypocalcemia spurs parathyroid hormone release from the parathyroids this accelerates osteoclast activity and calcium reabsorption by the kidneys and from the small intestine. The result is to increase the calcium levels in the blood. Calcitonin has the reverse effect and it is a hormone produced by the thyroid gland. Okay, chloride is the major anion in the extracellular fluid. It helps maintain the osmotic pressure of the blood. 99% of chloride is reabsorbed under normal pH. But when acidosis occurs, fewer chloride ions are reabsorbed. Other anions have transport maximums and excesses that are excreted in the urine. pH affects all functional proteins, so we have to monitor the body's pH very closely. Okay? If your body pH gets too high or too low, what's going to happen? We're going to screw up membrane potential and in addition to that, we're going to temp potentially denature protein, and that'll, of course, abrogate their function. Normal pH of body fluid, arterial blood around 7.4, venous blood and um, uh, IF fluid around pH 7.35. Uh, intracellular fluid, pH 7, not a surprise, okay? Alkalosis or alkalemia is an arterial pH greater than 7.45, and acidosis is an arterial pH of less than 7.35. And the body takes great pains to avoid this using both the respiratory system and the urinary system. Okay, They act in concert. In addition to that, chemical buffers are um, potent bulwarks against major changes in pH. Most acid is produced as a result of metabolism. Phosphorus containing protein breakdown releases phosphoric acid into the extracellular fluid and lactate comes from anaerobic respiration of glucose which occurs when we don't have sufficient oxygen delivery to metabolically active tissue. Fatty acids in ketone bodies are formed from fat metabolism. Protons are also liberated when carbon dioxide 
is converted into bicarbonate in the blood via the intermediate carbonic acid. Uh, we, we should probably revisit that chemical equation because it's pretty important. We'll put it up here in blue. Okay, So remember that when we have carbon dioxide and water, we form carbonic acid. This, of course, is in equilibrium. Carbonic acid, H2CO3. Carbonic acid can dissociate into bicarbonate. And, of course, the proton, which is what's going to lower the pH. Okay, so let's put an arrow here and write lowers pH. Okay, and where is this happening? This is happening in metabolically active tissue. The concentration of hydrogen ions is regulated by chemical buffer systems, which are a rapid first line of defense, and brainstem respiratory centers, which act over the course of a few minutes. Renal mechanisms are the most potent, but they take longer to act. Um, but they're no less critical in maintaining acid-base balance. So let's talk about our chemical buffer systems that maintain our pH in most body compartments near neutral. Strong acids dissociate completely in water and dramatically change the pH, while weak acids only dissociate partially. Strong bases dissociate easily, and weak bases accept protons more slowly. Um, again, you could think of a base as a proton acceptor and an acid as a proton donor. All right? and so what we're looking at here is a diagram showing you how pH changes in the presence of a strong and in a weak acid. So you've got two beakers of water here. One is, is going to have hydro hydrochloric acid added to it, and the other is going to have carbonic acid added to it. Now, hydrochloric acid is a strong acid, which means it dissociates completely in water. The result, as you can see, is that you form all of these free protons around. And remember that it's the free protons, which we'll circle here in red, that are responsible for lowering the pH. So look at all those free protons running around inside this beaker of water. Okay? A lot of free protons. If I were to add an equivalent molar amount of weak acid to this container of water, it would only dissociate partially. Look how many fewer protons are generated in a weak acid as opposed to a strong acid. So what chemical buffer systems are designed to do is to try and lock protons up either in the context of a weak acid or a weak base so that they don't dramatically shift the pH. Okay, and we'll see how that happens here in a second. A chemical buffer is a system of molecules dissolved in an aqueous solution that resist pH change when they're challenged with a strong acid or a base. They'll bind protons if the pH drops and they'll release them if the pH rises. The three major buffer systems are the bicarbonate, the phosphate, and the protein buffer systems. They all act together as a bulwark against pH change. So let's look at the bicarbonate buffer system first. It's basically a mix of carbonic acid and salts of bicarbonate that buffers the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid. It's the only important extracellular fluid buffer. If a strong acid is added to the bicarbonate buffer system, carbonic acid, uh, of course, is going to dissociate very easily into bicarbonate and protons. The bicarbonate that's present in the buffer system is going to tie up the protons and form carbonic acid. The carbonic acid, remember, is a weak acid. Okay, so let's make special note of that here. Uh, in red, we will indicate weak acid. Okay. Weak acid.
And because it's a weak acid, what do we know about it? We know that it's not going to dissociate very easily in aqueous solution. So here's a look at what happens when we add hydrochloric acid to a bicarbonate buffer system. We form carbonic acid. We also form salt, which is not going to have any effect on the pH whatsoever. If the pH decreases only slightly um, in the presence of this buffering system, we've accomplished our task. Um, what can happen, though, is we can eventually overload the buffer system and then the pH will begin to dramatically drop again under this acid challenge. So um, it's, it's a bulwark up to a point. Once you titrate out all the available um, bicarbonate anion, then you're going to see the pH rapidly drop under this scenario. Okay, So it'll plateau and then it'll drop. Bicarbonate concentration is very closely regulated by the kidneys. The kidneys have the ability to either excrete or um, reabsorb bicarbonate. If a strong base is added, it causes the weak acid to dissociate and donate the proton to the strong base. Now, when we talk about a strong base, we're specifically referring here to bases that produce hydroxide anion. The proton ties up the base by forming water, and the result then is that we've essentially now taken a strong base and we've converted it into a weak base. Okay, The weak base in this case is the water molecule. The pH only changes a little bit. Again, we can overload the buffer system if the base challenge is too strong. The um, carbonic acid supply in the body is almost limitless and is um, regulated by CO2 that's released by cellular respiration and it's subject to respiratory controls and also um, it's subject to control uh, via the urinary system. The phosphate buffer system also acts to resist pH changes. Its action is nearly identical to the bicarbonate buffer system Components include dihydrogen phosphate, which is a weak acid, and monohydrogen phosphate, which is a weak base. It's unimportant in the buffering of plasma, but it's an important buffer system in the urine and in the intracellular fluid where phosphate concentrations are relatively high. Okay, So um, one of the reasons that we want to buffer the um, components of the urinary system is we don't want to damage the excretory apparatus. If the pH of the urine were to fluctuate wildly, then we could potentially compromise the function of the kidney tubules, the ureters, and the urethra. And so the buffer systems are there to resist a lot of that. Okay. Now proteins are sort of a catch-all because protein buffer system is designed to um, really um, protect the body over a wide range of pHs. And the way this works is that proteins are made up of a collection of three different types of amino acids, right? Um, the building blocks of protein, the amino acids, uh, can either be charged amino acids, which have a positive or negative charge at neutral pH, so charged. We also have polar amino acids, and we have nonpolar amino acids. And that designation is based, of course, on the chemical composition of their R group, right? The only thing that differs from amino acid to amino acid. And in terms of um, which amino acids are the most important in, um, in buffering body fluids, it's going to be the charged and the polar amino acids to a lesser extent that are the major players. The nonpolar amino acids aren't going to participate much in this. So intercellular proteins are the most plentiful and powerful buffers. Plasma proteins are also critically important. Protein molecules are what we call amphoteric, which means they can function either as an acid or a base. Of course, depending on their composition in part, but also due to the fact that you've got in any given protein, a certain number of negatively and positively charged 
amino acids that act as um, acids or bases respectively. When the pH rises, organic acids or carboxyl groups will release their protons and when the pH falls, amino groups will bind protons and as a result significantly decrease uh, the pH change that would otherwise occur in the event of an acid or base challenge. Hemoglobin also functions as an intracellular buffer. Remember that hemoglobin is only found inside erythrocytes and there is quite a bit of buffering that goes on in the erythrocyte cytoplasm. Okay, the respiratory and the renal systems are other major players in uh, physiological buffering. They regulate the amount of acid and base in the body. They act more slowly than chemical buffer systems and they have more capacity than chemical buffer systems. Chemical buffers can't eliminate excess acids or bases from the body. They can only blunt their effect. The lungs eliminate volatile carbonic acid by eliminating carbon dioxide when you exhale, while the kidneys eliminate non-volatile acids made by cellular metabolism. And these include phosphoric, uric, and lactate, and ketones, and this prevents metabolic acidosis. The kidneys also regulate blood levels of alkaline substances, and they help to renew chemical buffers. So let's look at the respiratory system first. The respiratory system eliminates carbon dioxide, which can form carbonic acid when mixed with water. A reversible equilibrium res exists in the blood, shown here. We saw this a couple of slides ago. And essentially, um, Le Chatelier's principle dictates that when you put a strain on an equilibrium reaction, the reaction will respond by trying to maintain the ratios of reactants to products. The equilibrium constant is the fingerprint for any chemical reaction and it's going to differ for every chemical reaction you're going to have an endemic equilibrium constant and in the event that we stress an equilibrium reaction it will respond in kind. For instance, if we were to drain off carbon dioxide from this equilibrium reaction what would happen is that we would form more carbonic acid to form more CO2 in order to fill the void of the carbon dioxide being eliminated. The result is would be essentially to cause the pH of that system to rise because we would consume protons in that case in an effort to keep these ratios constant. The same thing is true if we were to load carbon dioxide into this equilibrium. We would form more carbonic acid. The result would be uh, a decrease in the pH because we would form more protons and bicarbonate. During carbon dioxide unloading, the reaction is going to shift to the left, and during carbon dioxide loading, the reaction shifts to the right, and of course the protons end up getting buffered by the chemical buffer systems, such as the protein and the phosphate buffer systems that are also acting at the same time. Hypercapnia activates medullary chemoreceptors and causes an increased respiratory rate and depth of breathing, so we blow off more CO2 to get rid of the CO2 accumulating in the tissue fluid and to bring the pH back up to normal. Rising plasma proton activates peripheral chemoreceptors. We see increased respiratory rate and depth. More carbon dioxide is removed from the blood and the proton concentration drops. Alkalosis has the reverse effect. It depresses the respiratory center. The respiratory rate and depth decrease. The proton concentration rises and the pH begins to drop. Respiratory system impairment can cause acid-base imbalance. Hypoventilation can lead to respiratory acidosis, while hyperventilation can lead to respiratory alkalosis. Uh, an example of this is in individuals who hyperventilate in response to a stressful situation. They can uh, end up fainting, we call that syncope, and one of the fixes for that is to have them breathe into a paper bag the idea there is that they rebreathe their own carbon dioxide and this brings the pH back down to normal. Okay, the urinary system is also a major player in this. The most important renal mechanisms conserve or reabsorb new bicarbonate and excrete bicarbonate. Generating or reabsorbing bicarbonate is the same as losing a proton. Excreting a bicarbonate is the same as gaining a proton.
to the body at least. To reabsorb bicarbonate, the kidney secretes protons, and to excrete excess bicarbonate, the kidney must retain protons. So this is one of the reasons why the pH of urine has a wide range compared to other body fluids, but again, because of the buffering systems present um, in the urine itself, which was once the filtrate, which is basically the, uh, the liquid component and the small solutes that are in blood plasma, um, we, we don't see um, as wild a shift as we would otherwise predict inside the kidney tubules or even in the uh, collecting ducts, the ureters or the urethra. Okay, renal regulation of acid-base balance depends on the kidney's ability to secrete protons. Proton secretion happens in the PCT and the collecting duct via the type A intercalated cells. The protons come from carbonic acid produced in reactions catalyzed by carbonic anhydrase inside cells. Carbonic anhydrase essentially catalyzes the formation of carbonic acid from CO2 and water. As protons are secreted, sodium is reabsorbed. The rate of proton secretion changes with extracellular fluid carbon dioxide levels. If carbon dioxide levels in the peritubular capillary blood rise, we're going to see an increase in the rate of proton secretion. And this kind of makes sense, right? If we see the CO2 level rise, what reaction is going to predominate? Well, we're going to shift that carbonic acid equilibrium reaction to the right will form more carbonic acid as a result will generate more protons so what we have to do in order to maintain now our proper pH levels is we have to secrete those protons so that the body pH doesn't shift too much. The system responds to both rising and falling proton concentrations by either secreting or reabsorbing protons or bicarbonate. And so what you're looking at here is just a look at how we deal with these pH changes in the excretory system, the urinary system. So we start here, number one, uh, with carbon dioxide combining with water forming carbonic acid, which is split to form bicarbonate and, of course, the free proton. The proton gets secreted in the filtrate. Well, what's the filtrate going to eventually be? It's eventually going to be the urine. For each proton that's secreted, a bicarbonate enters the peritubular capillary and the blood uh, either by a symport with sodium or antiport with chloride. Okay, And you can see that here. Okay, These are plasma membrane proteins that are involved, again, in actively moving these components from one side of the cell membrane to the other. Secreted protons combine with carbonic acid or bicarbonate in the filtrate and this forms carbonic acid which disappears from the filtrate at the same rate that bicarbonate enters the peritubular capillary in the blood. The carbonic acid formed in the filtrate dissociates to carbon dioxide and water the carbon dioxide diffuses into the tubule cell where it triggers further proton secretion. Okay, so you can see here the carbon dioxide moving into the tubule cell, again uh, forming now carbonic acid, and the result is going to be further proton secretion. Okay, so we form the carbon dioxide, it moves back in, and then we pump the protons back out. Okay, the idea eventually is that we're going to get rid of um, the excess protons that build up as a result of the accumulation of CO2. Okay, um, the active transport here, of course, is indicated by the red arrows, and the passive transport by the blue arrows. To maintain alkaline reserve, the kidneys replenish bicarbonate, yet the tubule cells cannot reabsorb it. So they have to conserve filtered bicarbonate in a roundabout fashion. So how do they do that? Well, carbon dioxide combines with water in the PCT cells forming carbonic acid, which dissociates into bicarbonate and protons, which are secreted. The bicarbonate is shunted into the capillary blood. 
and the secreted protons unite with bicarbonate to form carbonic acid in the filtrate. This generates carbon dioxide and water. The bicarbonate disappears from the filtrate at the same rate that it enters the peritubular capillary blood. Okay, So you can see here again revisiting the same scenario that we were looking at before. Okay, So the idea again is to buffer the filtrate but also more importantly to keep the pH of the blood between 7.35 and 7.45. How do we generate new bicarbonate ions? Well, <coughs> there's two mechanisms in the PCT and the type A intercalated cells that generate new carbonic acid, I'm sorry, new bicarbonate to be added to the alkaline reserve. They involve renal excretion of acid by secretion or excretion of protons or ammonium cations. So let's look at how we excrete buffered protons. Dietary protons have to be balanced by generating new uh, bicarbonate. Protons that are not excreted um, when filtered bicarbonate is reclaimed. So most are filtered bicarbonate is used up before the filtrate reaches the collecting duct and this generates new bicarbonate and counteracts the acidosis from dietary protons. The most important urine buffer is the phosphate buffer system. Intercalated cells actively secrete protons into the urine and this is buffered by phosphates and excreted. The generated new bicarbonate moves into the interstitial space via co-transport and then moves passively into the paratubular capillary blood. And so you can see here how the phosphate buffer system is operating. We start here with carbon dioxide combining with water forming carbonic acid. Next thing that happens, we split into bicarbonate and protons. The protons are going to enter the filtrate. The bicarbonate is going to enter now the peritubular capillary blood. The fate of the protons is to combine with the weak uh, base, okay, um, the uh, phosphate anion, forming now phosphoric acid, and this gets removed via the urine stream, okay. Uh, at the same time, for each proton that's secreted, a, a bicarbonate anion enters the peritubular capillary blood through an antiport. Uh, in a bicarbonate chloride exchange process. You can see here that as the bicarbonate moves across the, um, the, the tubule cells, there's a chloride that's going to be brought in. This is to do two things. This is to maintain membrane potential um, and at the same time um, we don't want to um, disturb now the uh, the balance of charge on the inside and outside of the membrane. Next thing that happens is the secreted protons combine with the phosphate anion. We form phosphoric acid. The phosphoric acid is excreted in the urine and the process is completed. Okay, ammonium is a more important mechanism for excreting acid. It involves the metabolism of glutamine in the proximal convoluted tubule cells each glutamine produces two ammoniums and two new bicarbonate anions. The bicarbonate moves to the blood and the ammonium is excreted in the urine and this replenishes the alkaline reserve of blood. And so here you can see again this buffering system. Okay, We start here with glutamine. Glutamine is one of those amino acids that has a positive charge at neutral pH. Glutamine moves from the filtrate into the uh, proximal convoluted tubule cells. It is then um, used in a deamination reaction and uh, what happens as a result is that we generate now ammonium which is going to act to trap protons uh, and to allow them to be excreted and we're also going to form um, some bicarbonate okay which is going to be used uh, transport out of the tubule cells 
and into the peritubular capillary blood. Okay, so the weak acid ammonium is secreted into the filtrate, um, and it takes the place of the proton on a sodium potassium antiport carrier. Okay, you can see that here. All right, and for each ammonium that's secreted, a bicarbonate enters the peritubular capillary blood through a symport and you can see that here all right next thing that happens is the ammonium is, sec is secreted in the urine and we get rid of two things at once right we get rid of excess protons and at the same time we remove the potentially toxic nitrogen containing compounds that are a result primarily of the breakdown of protein okay when the body's in alkalosis, type B intercalated cells secrete bicarbonate and reclaim protons to acidify the blood. The mechanism is opposite of bicarbonate ion reabsorption process that the type A intercalated cells carry out. Even during alkalosis, the nephrons and the collecting ducts conserve more bicarbonate than they're going to secrete. There are different abnormalities of acid-base balance that we have to consider as well. All are classified as either respiratory or metabolic. Let's talk first about respiratory acidosis and alkalosis. It's caused by a failure of the respiratory system to balance the body's pH. And the single most important factor here is the blood carbon dioxide concentration. Metabolic acidosis and alkalosis are abnormalities that are caused by carbon dioxide levels increasing in the blood or decreasing and are indicated by abnormal bicarbonate levels. The most important indicator of adequacy of respiratory function is the carbon dioxide level. It should be between 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. If it's above 45, we have respiratory acidosis, and this is a common cause of acid-base imbalance. It's usually due to a decrease in ventilation or gas exchange. How might this happen? Well, you might have uh, conditions such as emphysema, where you can't properly ventilate the lungs due to the fact that they scar or are coated with tar. Okay, um, You might have um, obstructive pulmonary disease, where you can't generate um, sufficient wind speed to get rid of your carbon dioxide. Um, and so what we have here is what we call gas trapping. This results in carbon dioxide accumulating in the blood, and it's characterized by a falling pH and a rising carbon dioxide level. A carbon dioxide level below 35 millimeters of mercury results in respiratory alkalosis. It's a common result of hyperventilation, often due to stress or to pain. Okay, and We already indicated one of the ways we can deal with that is by rebreathing our own CO2. CO2 gets eliminated faster than it's made, and the result in some cases can be syncope, known as... Okay, metabolic acidosis and alkalosis is essentially an outcome of the accumulation either of organic acids or bases in the tissue fluid as a result of um, situations that stress the production of waste products, either generating too many or uh, generating too few. Examples of how this can occur, causes for metabolic acidosis include ingestion of too much alcohol, which gets converted into acetic acid as an intermediate. This is going to cause the pH to drop. Um, excessive loss of bicarbonate through persistent diarrhea also is going to cause the pH to drop. You might say, well, how is that? Well, you're losing base buffering capability. The result is that the pH is going to drop. Accumulation of lactate, such as seen in exercise or shock. Um, ketosis, uh, which we see in diabetic crisis, in starvation, and also sometimes in kidney failure. Metabolic alkalosis is a lot less common than acidosis, and it's indicated by a rising blood pH and bicarbonate content. Causes include vomiting of the acid contents of the stomach or by the intake of SS, excess base such as antacids. If your blood pH falls below 6.8, we'll see suppression of central nervous system function leading to coma and death. 
If it's above pH 7.8, we'll see excitation of the nervous system resulting in tetany, nervousness, convulsions, and death from respiratory arrest. So how does the respiratory and the renal system compensate for this? If acid-base imbalance is due to the malfunction of the physiological buffer system, um, the other system is going to try to compensate. Okay? Respiratory system attempts to correct acid-base imbalances, and the kidneys attempt to correct respiratory acid-base imbalances. Okay? So respiratory comes in when it's a metabolic problem. Kidneys come in when it's a respiratory imbalance. Okay, changes in the respiratory rate and depth, depth are going to have a profound effect on the, the tissue fluid and the plasma pH. In metabolic acidosis, high proton levels are going to stimulate respiratory centers and the, ret the, date, the rate and the depth of breathing are going to increase. What is this going to do? This is going to blow off CO2, this is going to consume protons, and the pH is going to rise. If the blood pH is below 7.35 and the bicarbonate levels are low, as CO2 is eliminated by the respiratory system, the partial pressure of CO2 falls below normal. Respiratory compensation for metabolic acidosis is revealed by slow, shallow breathing, allowing the CO2 to accumulate in the blood, and a high pH, that being over 7.45, also elevated by carbonate levels, um, levels uh, of CO2 being above 45 millimeters of mercury are also major indicators of respiratory um, compensation for metabolic alkalosis. Okay, how does the excretory system act to counterbalance this? Well, renal compensation for respiratory acid base balance uh, comes into play. Um, hypoventilation is going to cause elevated carbon dioxide content leading to respiratory acidosis. The renal compensation uh, is indicated by a high partial pressure of CO2 and a high bicarbonate level, which indicates that the kidneys are compensating. Respiratory alkalosis exhibits low partial pressures of CO2 and high pH, and the renal compensation is indicated by decreasing bicarbonate levels. The respiratory system can't compensate for respiratory acidosis or alkalosis, and the renal system can't compensate for acid-base imbalances caused by renal problems. Infants have proportionally more extracellular fluid than adults at about two. Problems with fluid, electrolyte, and acid-base balance are most common in infancy, and they reflect low residual lung volume, high rate of fluid intake and output, and high metabolic rate, which yields more metabolic waste, as well as a high rate of insensible water loss. And the reason for this is that they have a high amount of surface area compared to their body size. We also have inefficient kidneys, especially during the first month. In the first month, newborns will risk dehydration and acidosis as a result. At puberty, sexual differences in body water content arise as males generate more muscle mass, and in old age, total body water often decreases. Homeostatic mechanisms also slow down as we age. The elderly, as a result, may be unresponsive to thirst, and this can put them at risk for dehydration and congestive heart failure, as well as diabetes that can cause fluid, electrolyte, or acid-base problems. And we talked in class about the fact that one of the ways you can check for dehydration is through a process called uh, tenting of the skin. You pinch the skin, and if the skin remains pinched after you release, that indicates a need for um, isotonic hydration. So. Uh, we'll either remind the individual to drink, or if they can't drink, we're going to rehydrate using isotonic IV. Okay, uh, that concludes what I have to say today. I will see everybody in class. Thank you.